Um, okay, here we go. You're good to go. All right. So I guess what was it two weeks ago? We did a little talk about their arms, and then last week Subutai said, "Hey, that was that was good. People liked it." Okay. I guess outside people liked it. I don't know. And uh, so he said, would I do another one? And I said, sure. And we talked about what topic to talk about. And so we came up with a series of topics. And um, I thought from an anatomy point of view, the next thing would be to talk about columns and mini columns. And then I was asked, Matt, you want me to talk about spatial cooler? And then I think geometry or somebody wanted to talk about temporal memory. But I thought I'd start with columns and we'd go from there. It's very informal. Ask questions. I don't have a big, long prepared uh, statement here. So it's really just sort of a, a little bit of an interaction. Um, but just to review where we last left off, there's you know lots of neurons in the in the cortex, of course, and roughly 80% of them uh, are excitatory, and those are broken into two broad classes, which some people argue is really just one class. So we talk about pyramidal cells, um, pyramidal cells, put time in the right place. Um, which we draw like this, which have an apical dendrite, basal dendrite, and then an axon. And then there's the uh, stellate cells, which people have argued that are really the same as the pyramidal cell without the apical dendrite. So they kind of one class. And then roughly 20% of the cells are inhibitory. And uh, some people argue up to 30%. And these come in many classes. They're really different. Um, so we can go through some of the differences in a moment here, but um, there are many, many different types of these guys, and there's different ways of classifying them. It's a very confusing area. Because some people use one set of words, other people the other set of words, and so on. But the way I like to think about this is that these inhibitory cells are really what implement the algorithms of the brain. Uh, Marcus, you can jump, please jump in if you have anything to add to what I'm saying, or if, you're ready, if I get anything wrong. So these sort of um, these sort of implement the algorithm of the brain. Like, well, you know, how does this thing do something besides just a bunch of neurons, right? Um, so the general belief is that most of the memory is stored in here, then these synapses, in not all of it, but most of it. And then these guys really control things, and they have very different morphologies and shapes and chemical properties and so on. Um, and so uh, they're mixed together everywhere in the neocortex. And so today I was going to talk about uh, columns. And so this is also a confusing topic. Um, if you look at a neocortex in a human, Matt, I think I, we hear you typing. I think you need to move. In a human, a neocortex is about two and a half millimeters thick. It varies a bit. Right? And um, one of the things you see, if you look under this under a microscope, of course, you see lots and lots of <laughs> uh, neurons. Um, but um, in some animals, some mammals, it's more obvious than others that one level of organization is this thing called a mini column. And a mini column is really skinny. It's, it's literally, it can be anywhere from like 50, maybe to 100 microns wide or in diameter. It depends on the animal, it depends on the part of the cortex. Different animals have different sizes. Um, there's some more noticeable in uh, some animals than the other. And, um, and so you got these guys like organized like this. We'll talk about why they say they exist in a second. But if they're this small, it roughly, roughly in a human, there's 200 million of them, um, uh, 200 million mini columns. Um, and the reason you see them is that the cells tend to be clustered in here with a, with sort of an interstitial gap between them. So if you were to slice the cortex, you, um, well, first of all, you'll see this, you'll see this sort of clustering here and then a relative gap and clustering in a relative gap and clustering in a relative gap. And if you're looking down on the surface, you might see sort of, um, um, what you'd see is he sort of, um, uh, areas where there are um, 
all these axons coming up together. That would be like there's these vertical axons going up and down in here, and then relative gaps between them. And you can see this might be visible even in even in the one out in the hallway here. I'm not sure the picture in the hallway, but sometimes uh, so these are these are physical things that um, that seem to exist. And and one and it's been debated over the years whether they do anything. Uh, because it, some, some animals are harder to see, and other animals are very visible, but that doesn't tell you anything because you could have the exact same connectivity and not be visibly separated and you do the same thing. Um, and um, they're also, we know that they're derived from uh, growth. So when an animal's brain starts developing, there's a progenitor cell or a region that sends these neurons all up. So basically all of these neurons in this one mini column seem to come from the same progenitor cell. So it's, a, it's an artifact of, of, of development. So one could argue they don't have a functional role. Um, but um, what's really, what was really telling is that when they, the general idea is when they first started sticking probes into the brain, um, they found that if you could measure the neurons along this this perpendicular axis, the, the ones that they measured from that, which is a small subset of all the neurons in there, they don't measure from all the neurons, they would measure from certain ones. This is like the cat who the weasel thing. They, you know, show a cat or some um, radiated signal and they try to find cells that respond to that. But when they did that, they found that these cells all had similar properties. And if you went over a little bit, these cells had a different property. And then you over a little bit, these cells had a different property. And as soon as you moved over to the next mini column, they had a different property again. So somehow these cells are all related to each other, or at least the ones they're measuring from. Again, it's a subset of all the cells. Uh, it would be a subset of the excitatory cells, typically. And most of the cells, they couldn't figure out what they did. So, but the ones they could measure from, they said, oh, the ones that do respond to this grading, you might say, oh, these all respond in the middle cortex. These might all respond to a, a vertical line, these respond to the next one or like this, and these respond to the next one like this, and these respond to the next one like that. And so as they as they move the probe, if they move the probe across at an angle like this, which is often what happened, um, they go through a series of responses. But if they could get it to go vertically, they get the same response. So that strongly suggests that there's a, a functional property to the to the mini columns. Um, and um, and that's a, a so that's that's a general idea there. Yeah. yeah. Is there a difference between midday columns and columns? And yes. Columns and yes. Columns? I'm gonna get the columns in a moment. Okay. The, yes. Yeah. Okay. It's very it, the literature is confusing about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so from a embryology point of view, uh, this 2.5 millimeters. What's what's the growth? I mean, how does it? Is it 2.5 in adults, but Oh, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a good question. I know it shrinks as you get older. Um, <laughs> everything in the brain shrinks when you get older. Um, but I think, I, I don't really know the answer to question. My, my impression is, and that's just an impression, that this is pretty much defined at birth, you know, and uh, there's this overperfusion of connections which disappear. But it's not something like it grows as you grow in life. It's not like it's getting bigger as you learn things. It's pretty much there. And uh, and it shrinks as you get older. <laughs> um, so there is um, one of the things that they've observed is that basically the rule of thumb they say there's about 110 neurons Brains. in these mini columns. Um, could be varying, you know. Different people Thanks, different, Tim. But this is one number that's banded about. And the basic idea is that all the different types of cells you're going to find, you're going to find in a single mini column. That was an idea. I don't know if it's been proven. Um, so you basically, this is a unit of computation that seems to incorporate everything, and yet it all, all these things somehow are related uh, in one way or another. So that's the mini column. It's a physical thing. It's there at, at uh, during development of the brain when you're in utero. Um, it also seems to have a functional role, which no one had really assigned a functional role to. No one understood why it's like that. We have a theory for why that is. Um, and um, and they vary in size based on animals, but roughly you can say about 200 million of them in a human. So Mountcastle, Vernon Mountcastle is one of the people who really uh, said, you know, this is obviously an important functional thing. We need to understand what this thing does. If you understand what this thing does, you got 200 million of them, they all look similar. 
Uh, there's one big exception in primates, in primates only. So uh, all mammals have neocortex, but primates. Um, V1, the, the primary visual cortex of V1 is got twice as many cells. Uh, and we can talk about that as a separate topic. But other animals who are not primates have visual systems like cats and dogs, and they don't have twice as many. And then we have these extra layers in V1 in humans. Uh, somehow we have better vision, um, and uh, we have these extra layers in here uh, that other mammals don't have. But the dogs can see, and dogs don't have um, striated V1. They don't have these extra cells. So twice as many cells per minute column, right? But twice as many cells per minute column, yeah. Or for any, any area in V1. So now, when we get to your question about column, when Cummins says a column, you have to be careful. Um, they might be talking about a mini column, but they shouldn't. They should say mini column. <laughs> um, but there is another column, which, uh, which is the following. You see this, like there's these properties here where this is the vertical line, right? And then as you move over, it responds to different lines. And if you keep going, um, you get back to a vertical line again. And um, if it turns out that if you look down at the surface of the cortex and you map out, like, and again, this was all done originally in the visual, primary visual cortex. You map out a surface of cortex. So now looking down at the surface of the cortex, um, so this is the you know, surface of the cortex here, looking down on the top. And so you might see um, a, a column that represents a vertical line here and a column that represents a vertical line here. And then one that represents it here, here, and in between, there's all these different properties you'll see. Anyway, if you take the area which represents all the different properties you can get before it repeats again, it's about roughly a millimeter by a millimeter. Um, and so, all so like one of these mini columns may process a particular type of orientation, a particular eye reference, like left eye or right eye, or combination of different color things. So there's other properties that are embedded in here. Um, and then you go to the next block over, it all repeats again, but it's a different part of the retina. So this idea of a sort of ensemble that covers all the different properties you might get in some part of the cortex, or some side of the century, is what is called a column. And um, it can be, and sometimes you can hear it called, uh, I think they use the word hypercolumn, I think that. Um, but uh, it's, it's a, it, this is not a physical thing in the sense that you can't see it. There's no demarcations here. There's no one that says, oh, here's the edge of it and here's the next one. It's a continuous sheet. But the idea that if you continue repeating in any direction, things repeat, you keep going in any direction, it repeat. So that's the larger column. Yeah, the parts of the cortex have these sort of well-defined kind of uh, boxes or areas that kind of repeat in a way. Well, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, so Vernon Mountcastle, he's one of the few people who really studied this. There's other people, but he was the one who really uh, talked about it at length. And so a lot of this research is old, but he argued that he argued that he saw this type of column organization everywhere. And the way he would do that, he would say, for example, he studied a lot of somatosensory cortex. So here's somatosensory cortex. And so imagine I have like a uh, millimeter blocks here, right? This is like one millimeter. And he would show that um, if, he, if he put a probe through here, um, what he argued, you, you, had, you would have these discontinuities into the area of the, the part of the body that was represented. So in this section right here, this, all the cells in this section would be representing, let's say, um, uh, if this was your forearm, that might be representing some area on your forearm. And then when you pass over some boundary, you jump to another area on your forearm. And so he was arguing that this is processing one area, this is processing another area, and this processes another area. In the same way that V1, this is processing one section of the, uh, the retina, and this is another section of the retina, and another section of the retina. So he has a, a famous paper, well, not famous, but one we read a lot, I read a lot, um, is that makes the argument that this sort of columnar organization exists everywhere. Uh, everywhere he's looked, everywhere you could measure it. In some of the higher areas of cortex, it's like they don't know what to look for, right? You can do this for like auditory cortex, you can do this for visual cortex, you can do this in metasensory cortex, anywhere where you can actually probe the animal and see what's going on. But other parts of the brain is very difficult to say. But he made he made a long argument and a long paper about 
all the evidence suggests that this sort of column of organizations exist everywhere. So it's a nice idea. Theoretically, it's a, um, it's a great idea. So uh, whether it's true or not uh, remains to be seen, but at the moment, I take it as basically that's the right thing to go until we know otherwise. I'm trying to back this on to um, something else I learned about uh, kind of the system in, uh, I guess, mice and smell sensor cortex, yeah. and like barrel. Yeah, barrel. barrel. Yeah, so yeah. Those are specific whiskers. Yeah, well, that's consistent with this idea. That would be considered a column. That would be considered a column. So in the mouse cortex, yeah, they, they have their whiskers are, um, are very active sensing devices. They're not just hairs, right? They sweep them back and forth. And they have the very, they can see with their whiskers in some sense. They, they can learn, they can recognize objects and know what things are. It's, a, it's, a, it's like our fingers in some sense. Um, so it's an active sense. And what they discovered, in the, if you're looking down on the, on the rats or mice in your cortex, you'll see the whiskers, there's a pattern of whiskers on their face. And those whiskers are represented um, literally mapped. One to one, there's these columns, the bigger columns, uh, mapped to each whisker. And I think it's quite visually, uh, it's clear, just by looking at yeah, it. Yes, yes, so yes, it's clear. Place. Yeah. In this case, it's an unusually clear ob observation. Um, you know, it's, and I think the, the reason, the way I've interpreted that is like, well, your retina is a continuous sheet, your skin is a continuous sheet. Here, the whiskers are not continuous. They're just unique things, and each one has its own column. So this is very consistent with Mount Council's basic proposal for columns everywhere. And just in this case, they're very visible, so we can study them and look at them. And so these have been uh, these have been very highly studied. There's a huge amount known about uh, the, the barrel cortex. They they call them barrel cortex because the, if you look at the a slice through here, um, it's like they look like a barrel. That's the idea. Of it. So barrel shaped. In the middle there. So physiologically, they actually look like they separate. Yeah, if you could, just, yeah, just, just yeah, they do. You you would you would see a, you see these uh, literally if you can stain or, or look at the neurons, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you have a way of, of looking at them, you'll see that the cell bodies were densely connected here with a little gap in between them, and more cell bodies here, and these are literally connected to each retina, uh, each whisker. So they're visually visible. Barrel. That's that's what makes them unique. Where in visual cortex and somatosensory cortex, you don't see the columns. You see the mini columns, but you don't see the columns themselves. Um, so again, I think that's a uniqueness due to the fact that the the, the hairs are distinct, um, and therefore they can be mapped out this way. But the the photoreceptors on the retina, or the, the, on your skin, are not separated at all in any way. But anyway, these are I, these are actually one second. But these are these are on the small side. I believe these are about half a millimeter each, um, but they would still qualify as a column in that sense. Yeah. So these are two-dimensional maps. What happens for the auditory? Well, a visual actually is more than two dimensions too, because right. you've got depth, you've got ocular dominance, and you've got color. You got a whole bunch of stuff that right. map. So the general rule is. Um, it, it seems like what cortex does, or the brain does, or evolution has done, it takes multiple dimensions. And you have multiple dimensions in your skin. You have um, you have you have various probably you have hot and cold sensors. You have sharp sensors. You have vibration sensors. You have pressure sensors. All these things are mapped, and they all sort of overlay on top of each other. So when you look at a column in the cortex, I like. Uh, uh, remember, I talked about how the, the visual hypercolumn was a millimeter squared. Uh, in there, you have all those dimensions mapped, and they're they're mapped in these kind of weird little uh, overlapping wavy patterns. But the point was that within one square millimeter, whatever property you have is going to repeat. So if that's the property of orientation, it's going to repeat. If it's the property of ocular dominance, it's going to repeat. Like left eye, right eye. If it's property of, um, 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 I don't know, I'm trying to think of another one right now, but um, um, uh, any property you have would repeat within that. So they're sort of all interlaced on top of one another. But uh, the general belief that within a mini column, it's one set. So that mini column represents this set of n properties. 
at, you know, and, and so you have a sort of mixture of these things all sort of interlaced on top of one another. So do you yeah. see these many columns with, uh, in sort of like input senses, but you also see these like input sensor information, but you also see these many columns in like higher levels of hierarchy? Well, I've always said in neuroscience, there's, there's exceptions to every rule, and no matter what you say, someone's going to say it's wrong. Um, the answer is yes, with that caveat, right? Someone's going to say, well, we haven't looked everywhere. Okay. Or I looked at this animal, we looked at the aardvark, and the aardvark doesn't have, you know, I didn't see these, whatever, you know, and uh, I'm making that up, but, but that kind of thing. So the general idea is, for those who like are theoretically inclined and say, yeah, we seem to see these everywhere. Um, it was interesting, for example, some people used to say, well, we don't see many columns in mice. Just don't see them. And then that was the, the standard rule for many, many years, decades. And then was recently, I think, we saw a paper that says, oh, I found many columns in mice. You know, who knows? So I think from a theoretical point of view, we should go on the assumption that many columns exist everywhere, even if they're not visible. Because again, you don't have to be visible to have the same functional structure, right? If the neurons are all connected exactly the same way and you just shift them around a little bit, they're still going to do the same thing. So, so the physicalness of it is not essential, um, but the fact that we do see them almost everywhere, I think we should assume that many columns exist everywhere. That would be the, the there's, that would be, that's my assumption. And I, my assumption, I buy into Mount the argument that columns exist everywhere, too, even if we can't. Uh, see them. Did Mount Castle talk about many columns as well? Oh, no, he talked a lot about many columns. Oh, he talked about that, yeah. yeah. He, his main thing, he think, was to say that his, in his first paper about this, he said many columns are the, the organizing principle. And then later he argued uh, that columns are the organizing, you know, both. And uh, he got a lot of pushback initially. His, his initial papers on this, he argued that the column was dynamic, that it, it could, under varying conditions at moment to moment, could change. Then he retracted that. I, I think his last thing was, he said, no, I think they're, they're fixed. They're, they're fixed after learning. Something like that. If you remember anything different, Marcus, speak up. No, that, that just what I remember, though, that, that last part, I, you're my source on that. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. Uh, well, what's, yeah, well, clearly what's going on, well, that's, I'm not sure if it's expand, but clearly what they represent is dynamic. There's no question about that. Because you can take this visual, you take a piece of cortex and plug in something else into it, and it will represent something else. Yeah. So whether the size is dynamic is a question, um, but clearly what it represents is dynamic. For example, the size could be determined by some of these inhibitory cells that just span a certain dimension, and they say that's going to define the width of a column. You know, like, a, like I take a basket cell and it says, okay, I'm going to inhibit this millimeter wide area, and that's going to define the size of the column. So um, I, I, my working assumptions all along have always been many columns are fixed in size. Um, they, have, they exist everywhere. Uh, the, the larger columns exist everywhere. They're different sizes in different animals, just like the mini columns, uh, but it's a general property of the cortex. And this idea that you, multi you drop in multiple dimensions on top of uh, a region of cortex and they map into a, a column and all those dimensions are all represented within that, um, in that area seems to be the general rule for how these things go. Um, so, what, you now we can talk about, yeah. In, in the red example, it's fair to assume that if you remove half of the column, that the remaining columns will remap all the the whiskers, or should we understand that if we remove half the columns, it's just going to lose the sensation of half of the whiskers? Um, How is that? I don't. Which is when? Yeah, when. Right. When, like. Okay, so. So the thing that bothered me about your question is you asked about the rat, and so there probably is an answer to that question about the rice mouse to the rat, and I don't know the answer to the mouse because you know what they do? They do all this stuff. Okay. But it, the general rule would be that um, if you de-innervate any part of the cortex, so it no longer receives an input from something, like you cut the axons or something like that, what will generally happen is all these, I don't say it's true for the right barrel cortex, because that could be totally hardwired by evolution, right? 
But the general principle would be, for example, if you did this to your visual cortex or your auditory cortex or some other part of your cortex, the general thing would be if you you de-enervate some part of it, that those that basically everybody reshuffles to what they, they fill in the hole. You won't have this remaining gap here. Similarly, if I cut out part of the cortex, uh, then what was represented by that part of the cortex now gets represented by here, and everybody moves apart. Okay. Right? Our um, that was one of the nice things about our spatial pooler. It has this property that, and we tested this extensively. Um, by the way, in, a, in an animal like a human. If you have trauma to part of your brain, like you lost part of your brain or you lost some of the input to the brain, basically over a four month period, these things will move to compensate as much as possible. If it was a small enough trauma, you can completely recover your abilities. So when someone has a, 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 an accident or a mini stroke, you say, oh my God, they can't speak or they can't do this, they can't do that. Sometimes within four months, they recover. Um, if it's not too big an area, if it's too big an area, you're closed. So, but if it's small enough area, then this, everybody kind of read all the, act, all the inputs, they equalize out. And our spatial pooler does that. Our spatial pooler, because of the, 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 there's an end winner, take end winner situation, and there's a boosting situation, if some, of the, if some of the columns, and we'll talk about the spatial pool in a moment, if some of the columns are not getting input, then they will try to connect to the other connect, uh, inputs nearby. And when they connect those other inputs nearby, I was looking at these set of inputs and then you're over there saying, you start stealing some of mine. And then I say, okay, you're stealing some of mine, I'm gonna steal some of my neighbors and everybody kind of shifts over a little bit uh, and it worked really nicely. Uh, it was beautiful. In fact, I, as far as I know, that was the first uh, neural simulation that actually captured that property. Um, and and that, was, that was kind of cool. So, okay, so that's it for mini comms, and now I'm gonna talk about spatial pooler, if that's a good time to do that. Okay, so um, this is like, this is anatomy. So uh, now we're talking about um, our theories about this. So uh, one of the things we, we I, won't, I, I won't be able to recreate the whole history here, but we were trying to come up with a sequence memory algorithm, which became our temple memory. And one of the things we had to do is we had to come up with a way of representing inputs in a sparse way. And so we just took the mini column idea, or I took the mini column idea, and I said, okay, um, basically, uh, what the mini columns are doing is we're taking some input space and dividing it up, right, in, in some sort of basis set, right? And, and so when you think about vision, the, mo the simplest basis set would be maybe a line orientation. Now, if I look at the patterns in you know, some section of the retina, what are the most common patterns I'm going to see? It would be it would be the most common would be edges or you know the board filter type of thing. So and then it says okay well let's I'm going to divide this up into ten different or twenty different categories whatever it is I'm going to I'm going to then um, uh, I want I want to equally divide it up and that's what our spatial pooler does. So what we did with the spatial pooler we sort of said like imagine each mini column is competing with each other um, so that they all represent something different. And they can only repeat, in this case, they can only repeat within some distance from each other. So after you get beyond that uh, the inhibition distance, they can start representing the same thing again. So that was the basis of the spatial pooler. And, and then we said what the spatial pooler is doing is essentially determining the basic uh, function of each mini column or you know, each, each bit in, 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 a, in some way. And, and if you gave it a visual system, we'd pick this out. If you gave it some other input system, we'd pick something else out. And then we, the complex function of an entire minicom is, is really complex, right? You've got 110 cells, you've got many, many different cell types, you've got all these different layers in here. So um, we just said, what if we just took one simple layer, like a layer four, which is getting the inputs. Um, and within that layer, if I said there were like six layers here and maybe there'd be, um, uh, very roughly, I could say there might be, um, um, would that be like 16 cells in here, right? They're just divided by six, 110 divided by six. Um, and so I'd say, okay, in this little section here, I've got, you know, little mini columns, and then the next mini column over, and the next mini column over, and the next mini column over, and the next mini column over. And there was, I say, 16 cells in each of these. Um, and each of these is gonna be representing some different, uh, the spatial pool would basically any input and allow you to um, 
uh, sparsify it um, in such a way that every once in a while you have a, an active column and then the other columns are relatively inactive. I don't know if that's clear. Just, just inhibition. If you know the spatial pool algorithm, it's pretty simple. You just have the inhibition and a boosting function and learn it. And you just feed it data, and over time, it basically parses up the input space in the most efficient way it knows how. Now, there's a bunch of things that are different in the spatial pool than in the real brain. In the real brain, we have we have this topology where, like, oh, I have a retina, and then this block representing one block of retina, and the next one representing another block of retina, and the next one representing another block of retina. We didn't do that. We just said, oh, let's take some number or some input something. And we weren't, initially, we weren't doing this topology. We weren't trying to do visual systems or something like that, or word systems. So we just said, okay, we're, we're just going to take a bunch of mini comms, feed it some variables, uh, and we're going to have them compete with one another and sort of learn how that works. Now, a couple of um, the advantage of this is, by the way, um, another, I'll come back more to the spatial pool in a moment. Um, if you think about, well, you have 16 cells in each one, one of the things we knew from biology is that when you have a recognized pattern, like you're in a sequence that you, or the visual scene, or something you recognize, what you have is much sparser activity. This is an observed property of brains, right? So when you have unexpected input, you get a lot of activity. And when you have an expected input, you have much less activity. And so I simplified that and I said, okay, let's assume that when you have an unexpected input, all these neurons become active. But if you have a predicted input, an expected input, then maybe fewer number, let's go to one, is active. So, right? so um, and then we realized that this would be a very, very efficient way of solving the memory, a higher order memory problem, because essentially your active mini columns, which whatever mini columns you have active, um, you can represent that input, that represents an input, that's, that's what the current input is, but depending on which cells you activate, um, you can you can represent that input in a very very large number of contexts, right? So this bit can be represented in one of sixteen con uh, one of sixteen ways, and the next bit can be in one of sixteen ways. So if I'm representing some input with twenty active bits, then each one can be represented as it's one of sixteen ways. You get you get twenty to the six or sixteen to the twentieth uh, different ways of representing this input. Huge number, you know. And and if you do the math, going much you know, going up, we, we did a lot of modeling at 32 cells per mini column, but it really doesn't make a difference. Uh, once you're in the, this is the sort of a good number, you're 16 and above, it's really, the numbers are very, very large. So this idea of these two representations, the mini column representation, which represents the, the base input, uh, and then individual cells active in those mini columns represents that input in a particular context. And the capacity of that is extremely high. So you can represent the same input in you know, a trillion different contexts and, it, and no, no problem. So that was one of the core things you needed for um, uh, for sequence memory is to be able to take an input and represent in, in very high order context. And then, um, and I can go through that in more detail if you want, but um, let me go back to the neuroscience a little bit. One of the, if, is that okay? Let's get questions about that. Okay. One of the challenges of this, so this was a new proposal. As far as we know, no one has ever proposed this besides us. Um, uh, a functional purpose for why you have these mini columns and how they might work like this. Um, uh, what was I just going to say? Um, oh, one of the challenges of this, so imagine now I have all these cells here. So I got, I'm just looking at one layer right now, right? I'm just talking about one layer in this, this thing. I got all these cells in the mini column, let's see. 16 of them or so. And um, well, first of all, this says that they all have to respond to the same input. That is, all these cells have to basically fire at the same time if I'm not in context. That's part of the temporal memory algorithm. It's like they all represent the same basic feed forward pattern in the visual space that might be in a line and orientation like that. So, one question is how do they all learn to respond to the same thing? Right? And the second question is how do they respond, you know, uniquely under different contexts. Um, so the first one is an interesting anatomical problem, which we didn't even put in our first papers about this, um, the white paper, we didn't mention this. But it is a challenge to how these neurons can all learn to respond to the same thing. 
And uh, one of the, uh, the, the best thing, we, the best thing we know about this, I'm like, what I believe is going on, if you go back to these inhibitory cells, and one of these classes of inhibitory cells essentially defines the mini column. Uh, there's various ones uh, they're, of, of their, they're basic of a, of a class called bipolar, meaning they have two axons that go up and down in the very, very, very skinny the lines are like this. And uh, another, they, some of them go by the uh, name of uh, double bouquet cells. These, these terms are very interchanged. Sometimes I mean the same thing, sometimes I mean different things. But there's a, set, there's a couple of types of inhibitory neurons that have this property where they're very skinny projections vertically up and down like this. And they affect all of these cells. Um, they define, in some sense, the mini -com. They, they They are the functional definition of mini -com. And then what we learned later was that the, these cells uh, also have the same uh, orientation property. And they also are learned. That orientation property is learned. So this is exactly what we needed uh, because you needed some way of forcing all these neurons, which actually are trying to inhibit one another. We need some way of enforcing them all to basically learn the same thing on the proximal dendrites. That's part of the, the, the answer. That they, on the proximal and close to the cell body, these cells all have to have the same input. Um, and so at least this is the beginning of a mechanism to enforce that because inhibitory cells tend to be, first of all, inhibitory cells get the same input as these cells. So every, it's a general rule when, when an axon projection to cortex, it projects to local inhibitory cells and antrox cells. Um, and this guy can learn the pattern and this guy could then enforce these guys to learn the same pattern. Uh, and it could do that through um, a double inhibition. It could, for example, it could, it could inhibit the, uh, the basket cells, which would then, then promote all these guys to fire at the same time. I won't get into the details of that. But this kind of mechanism is required for this thing to work. And although from a three theory point of view, we don't have to talk about that. From a theory point of view, we just model this. We say our spatial pool of bit, our spatial pool of mini column has a dendritic segment that recognizes the input pattern. Um, well, in reality, it's more complicated than that. There has to be an inhibitory cell like this, which recognizes the input pattern. And these cells also have to recognize the input pattern. This kind of cell has to say, under certain conditions, I'm going to tell you all guys to fire so that you all are going to learn that same pattern. <laughs> and then on the other hand, during the normal operation of the system, the temporal memory, and I won't, I won't get into this unless you want me to review it with you. There are, so these are like, this would be like a bipolar cell or a double bouquet cell. There are also these basket cells, which send out, um, they're all over the place. This is the most common inhibitory cell, and they're very tightly tuppled to every pyramidal cell. And what we need is when a pyramidal cell spikes, and spikes, it inhibits all of its neighbors, um, but only if it spikes a little bit earlier. So we have this mechanism where if one cell spikes a little bit earlier and inhibits its neighbors, but if, if it doesn't, if they all spike at the same time, then nobody gets inhibited, or nobody initially gets inhibited. They all spike and then one wing gets So the, all the mechanisms we needed in the temporal memory and the spatial pool are all this support for all of them in, the, in these basic cell types. So we're, again, if, I, if, 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 if nobody has been depolarized in our temporal memory, so then the input comes in, all these cells emit a spike or two, um, but then what we need, what we require after that is that then there's going to be a winner because we have to train on a winner. We have to pick a winner for continuous learning. But initially they all spike. Uh, and then we pick a winner. Or if one of them was depolarized, we just go right to that winner and we don't let everyone spike. So these mechanisms support that. Uh, they, they do all that stuff. Do you pick one winner per minute? That's the way we do it. Um, it doesn't have to be. It could be any sparse. Set. You could do two or three, it doesn't really matter. Um, there's not much uh, advantage to doing that. Um, so I don't want them to say it has to be one. That's how we model it. But it has to be sparse. I, I think we might have done some simulations once early on where we allow two or three of these guys to be active at once. Uh, it really doesn't make a difference. It, 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 it does make a difference because all you have to do is have the, the, the set of active cells has to be unique. But if you pick more than one cell, so the cells are going to complex, isn't it easier to generalize? So if we're just picking one cell, we can never generalize, we're just summarizing the same complex. Uh, so if you pick like three or four and then add an overlap, then you can generalize. You can maybe, I'm not sure, sure, you might be right, Lucas, but it's not clear to me because over in the end, we're going to create a set of cells that are active, sparse set. 
Um, and the assumption is initially you pick randomly. And if I, if I picked randomly three or two or one, I'm not sure that would really make a difference, uh, but maybe you can make the argument it would. Um, I mean, it's an interesting idea, but it's not clear that it would do that. One still can make many predictions. So I think it doesn't necessarily limit their position. Or what was the idea behind it? Yeah, yeah so the one still can make many predictions, but each, uh, each pattern always represents the same context. And if you want to generalize between similar contexts, mm -hmm. then yeah, yeah. So there's like a, yeah. a temporal orthogonality that we have yeah. 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 so potentially. Yeah, it really depends on how you pick those three active cells, I think. Um, that's, a, that's a great, I mean, we've never really solved the generalization problem here. Um, and it's an interesting idea. I, I, I still think, I, I still will go back to, I don't really see the difference. If, if, if the same three cells became active every time in a particular context, it's just good as one cell. It, it doesn't really add anything. I'd have to say under, I'd have to say under two related contexts, somehow generalized, that I would pick a subset of the same cells active. I don't know how I'd know that. It's an interesting question. It's also not as simple as this. Um, in, in reality, what you'll see is the neurons here, um, like in this mini column, these neurons will be most active, but these will be a little active, and these will be a little active, and then less so, so it's a graded potential. So that's different. Um, so, that, you know, the things we're not incorporating into this. Well, yeah, and and that, that is like an interesting distinction that, um, that when we talk about the spatial cooler, when we talk about th these mini column codes, um, those SDRs, those uh, representations have this overlap property right. where, uh, where semantically similar inputs get semantically similar outputs. Yes. They, they, uh, nice whereas once we go to this step, the sparse, uh, the sparsification kind of throws that out the window yeah. uh, where the, the overlap property is just gone. Uh, and should we try to bring it, bring it back in some way like you just brought it up? I don't know. Uh, that, yeah, that, that's this like has been a perennial question. So this whole idea of uh, the semantic representation in the SDR and the spot spatial pool output, that's that's the basic of all of protocol L's work. They saw that and go, oh, semantic representation. But as Marcus has pointed out, as soon as we go to this like random selection into bits, we've lost it. Now you just have this, you know, this one pattern that just means this is the, the 23rd interval of Buffett and Beethoven's, you know, fourth symptom, and that's all it means. Um, and it doesn't mean anything else. It's just it. one thing unique in the world. I can't relate it to something else. Um, this, this idea of lack of generalization always bothered me, but I never saw a way out of it. And more my recent work, uh, based on what Mark has proposed uh, well, a lot with the uh, displacement cells, I have, I'm, I'm more hopeful about that. I think displacement cells inherently represent, um, they give us the ability to generalize, and that's a longer topic, but uh, so, so generalization may be occurring elsewhere. It, this, remember, this is just like modeling one little layer of cells here. There's a lot of other stuff going on here. Um, and so, you know, our, our goal all along has been to try to figure out what these other layers are doing and how they play together. Um, and a lot of the stuff we've done recently is into that. So I think, I think generalization is a more complex problem. My current guess is if it's not solved in this input layer um, and that it's solved in other mechanisms in, in the column. Um, so uh, I was asked to talk about the spatial pool. I didn't go through it in detail. Um, I sort of gave you the biological relevance for it. Is there any questions about that? I think the question about connectivity. Um, okay. First, I think I understand that in general, uh, we've seen increases in activation in prediction errors, right? So we have some sort of notion of, uh, you know, we unexpected input for some more. Yeah. Um, has that is a specific kind of column level bursting been experimentally? Um, I don't believe the question has been has that bursting at the column level been seen like this very specific column level. I'm not aware of that. Um, no, but what we have seen, very related to it, um, this idea that an individual cell here's here's this experiment they've done a lot of. They they basically try to characterize what a cell represents, and they do that by giving a sort of a, you know envision they would do that by giving these sinusoidal gradients, right? Which is like pattern without context. It's really just like a base pattern. And so they say, okay, this cell seems to prefer 
you know, with this type of uh, visual input. Then they show that visual input um, to that cell, but in the context of sequences like videos. Um, and so they know that the cell on the retina, they, they know the retina is getting the exact same pattern it got when it responded the first time, right? But now it's in some temporal and spatial context. And what they've shown is that these cells do not fire most of the time when you would expect them to fire. So they only fire certain parts in the video and they fire fairly reliably at that point. So they seem to say, I'm gonna fire at that particular context when that input, but most of the other times, like, you know, I get that input, I won't fire, but when I see that particular context, I do fire. And so that data fits beautifully with all of this. Um, and I haven't seen any, I can't remember all the details of it now, but they've done this in multiple modalities, not just vision. And the general rule seems to apply even sort of the, the, the level of, uh, when I read those papers, I say, oh, is it firing about the right amount of time? You know, and it is. Um, so there's a lot of evidence that this basic mechanism is actually on the play. Like, so people look at it like, how could it know? You know, I mean, how, why is it do that? Why is it not firing? You know, like, well, this explains why it's not firing. But most of that research was done before we published this stuff. So we can explain that. And that's very close. It's not exactly what you asked for, but it's, a, it's in some sense, I think it's a stronger uh, support for the theory. Uh, than that they all fire at the same time. Yeah, this really supports the unique roles for temporal context. Yes, and, and, and they also support the idea that every one of these cells seems to respond to this input under a sinusoidal input. Um, so that's not really bursting, but that's sort of like, I mean, it is bursting. It's, it's not like I'm going along in the, in the video and all of a sudden I give you, you know, an unexpected input, but it's saying, well, if I give you input that can't be expected or it's a very simple input, they all respond. And in, and in temporal context, uh, learned temporal time only happens if it's a realistic temporal context. If you, if you give it noise and, and there's a, in this context that hasn't learned, then these cells all respond again. Oh, so, well, I didn't realize that. You were saying when they were given simple sinusoidal input. That's how they define that every one of these cells seems to respond to that, right? Yeah, well, I, they don't check them all. They, 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 whatever they find one that it's the receptive field of each of those cells. Will yeah, see. yeah. So, so then they pick. Well, they pick one cell. They find out what it responds to. Presumably, go back to Hubble and Beasley. They pick another cell right above it. It would respond to the same thing. That's the, that's the basic idea, right? So they don't. I think that's an assumption. They don't test that idea. But they say, okay, what does this cell respond to? It responds reliably under under these uh, sort of uh, very basic test conditions. That the way they determine, they've come up with a set of procedures to determine what does that cell like, and it requires reliably. Okay, that cell always requires from this condition. And then they put it in a temporal context, a realistic context, both temporal and spatial context, and it doesn't fire reliably. It still only, only fires when it has an input, but it doesn't do it under most contexts. So it's still representing the same thing, but most times it's inhibited and it doesn't fire. Do they have some notion as to what part of the visual system habituation occurs? Is it retinal? Is it neocortex? Is it habituation? Is this the idea that um, that neurons stop responding because you know because they've been too active, right? Okay. Right. That's what habituation is. And I was like, uh, you know, you keep hitting me in my arm. If they stop hitting me in my arm, if they keep going after a while, they're going to door. That's the theory. Um, uh, so um, I think. I, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself an expert on this, but habituation is sort of a, almost a, a, a property of neurons. It's, it's not like a, a learned property or something like that. It's like things get tired and I stop responding, you know, and after a while, you know, you have to do something else. Um, so habituation is not generally viewed as a, I mean, you could, there, are, there are certain terms like the, uh, Ken Dell did this work with the Aplysia snail, right, where they, they the simple sea slug. And they poke, they poke it, and it retracts its gill. That's that's its behavior, you know. And then after a while, you keep poking it, keep poking. It, after a while, it doesn't retract its gill. So that's kind of learning, and you might call that habituation. I, they call it learning. But I think when the term habituation is usually used, um, is the things get sort of I, I don't know. I don't associate it with learning. I associate it with just like you know wearing out and sort of stops responding after a while. I just wonder if there's a more active form of that because when you stare at a visual pattern. There's a tendency, uh, if nothing is moving, for it to edit out that. So it could either be it gets tired or. Oh, I mean, like if you, if you freeze the eye. Right. Yeah, that's so you can't do that. But if someone actually does that, uh, you can't stop moving, right? You're always moving. But yeah, if, you, if they actually immobilize the eye or they, they 
the equivalent when they move the image with the eye, um, then you stop seeing it. Um, um, so I, I, the, uh, that's a well-known fact, been around for ages. Um, I, I have never really thought about it as a theoretically important function. It, to me, it's more like, okay, the brain is built on temporal processing. If you stop giving it temporal patterns, it's just everybody gets tired and they stop firing or something like that. That's, that's a poor man's explanation. Yeah, I just want you to know, if, if, if you do that, what is it? Fill in the blank with. <laughs> I think you just stop. I haven't had it done to me, but my understanding is you just stop seeing anything. Why? I don't know. There's also the sort of retinal situation that happens when you know, show these uh, stimuli or like inverted color photos, right. and then you see a black and white photo. I think isn't that sort of evidence of a retinal? What's, what's that? One? I don't know that one. Um, like the color receptors get higher in the retina. And then for what? For an inverted photo? Because you're, seeing, you're, just, you're staring at an inverted color photo for like 30 Oh, inverted seconds. color. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then you see black and white. Yeah. Like that. That's a yeah. That's a that's supposedly just a, the photoreceptors are getting exactly. worn out. So that'd be retinal <laughs> situation. Yeah. 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 So it, it can't happen at the lower level itself. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was wondering. If yeah. So yeah. So the way I mean, it could be wrong. But the way we've thought about this is um, properties like that are really there's a bunch of physiological properties that cells do that really aren't theoretically important. So the fact that the photoreceptors make it worn out, that's not, that's not really theoretically important. That's what biology does, you know. Or you, you deplete your, you know, some your energy and you get tired. Well, okay, fine. But AI systems don't have to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, so that was it for me, what I wanted to talk about today. I just wanted to just go through the mini columns and the columns. Um, and if we do this again, maybe we can talk about layers. <laughs> you can do that soon. I'm just not prepared to do that today. I thought about that. All right. We do what you want at any time. Put one more question. Two more questions. Any more questions? We don't have virtual anymore. We used to have the gavel. We done the session. We had a virtual gavel. Thanks, Jeff. Um, all right. That's it then. All right. I'm going to stop the stream. Thanks, everybody, for watching.